Hello and welcome to Well Capitalized. I'm your host, Bobby Kingsbury, Managing Director at MCM Capital Partners. And today we're continuing our discussion on M&A due diligence. And today we're talking about the financial and accounting, financial and tax side of it. And with us today, we have Justin Thomas from Cohen & Company. Thanks for having me, Bobby. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Can you uh, just start by giving us a little bit of your background and maybe a little bit about, uh, about Cohen? Sure. Uh, Cohen & Company is a middle market focused uh, accounting firm based in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, you know, offer traditional accounting and tax services primarily to privately held companies. Um, and we also have a management consulting division, which my group is a part of. I run our transaction services division. So we specialize in doing accounting and tax due diligence uh, for companies that are entering into an acquisition, whether that be uh, for the buyer or as the seller. Got it. And we'll just a little bit of background on yourself. Sure, you uh, I've, I've run the practice at Cohen for a little over five years. The 13 years before that, I was uh, doing the same type of work for PwC, one of the big four accounting firms. Great, so get, getting into uh, the, the crux of, of the subject, what does uh, the financial and tax diligence actually entail from a transaction standpoint? Sure thing. So. Our work primarily entails a, a deep dive look at the historical financials and tax position of a company. So as you know, an investor, uh, you're going to be lo looking hard at the historical financials of the business to make sure that they align with your understanding of valuation that you've offered to a business owner. Um, usually prior to the point we get involved, someone like yourself has had minimal uh, minimal access to the company and its financial statements, probably some high level information, um, but haven't had a chance to deep dive. So what we do is we go in, um, you know, in a try to in a condensed time frame, understand the financials at a very specific level, understand what's going on with the business, um, understand any add backs to EBITDA, which we can talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. um, what those mean, and just generally try to make sure all the parties have a good understanding of the financial condition of the business and any tax risks that might exist. Got it. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure the list is pretty voluminous, but what, what uh, information are you going to request from a, a business owner? Sure. Um, some of it will depend on the company and the type of company, but the general things are just detailed financial records, usually for the last three years. Mm -hmm. Usually the period we look at is three years back, it may go up to five years, but generally three years. Um, so detailed financial records of your income statement, your trial balance, you know, some things like detailed sales analysis, um, you know, whether that be sales and potentially margin by customer, by product okay. line, things like that, again, to get a better and deeper understanding of where the sales dollars and margin of the business are coming from. Um, and then more, you know, typical things would be understanding the accounts receivable position of the company, looking at details of the inventory over time, just to make sure we understand the assets that will be acquired in mm -hmm. the transaction. Um, from the tax side, we're going to be making sure that all of your filings are up to date uh, when looking at it from a state level, that you're filing yet returns, whether that be income, income tax returns or sales and use tax returns in the right states, depending on where you have activity. Um, that can be, you know, one that, that is a little tricky because just from time to time those states like to change the rules and small business owners don't, don't always have the ability to stay on top of that. Um, and that generally is again a three to five year period where we're looking back at that activity. Got it. And then, I, uh, you know, when we had talked before, you were kind enough to offer a just a standard diligence uh, checklist that we can provide to the business owners listening in and, and watching. Yep, and then that should give you a good idea of at least the basics of what should be uh, requested in a, in a general sense. And you know, depending on your business, there may be more or less from there, but that should be a good start. Yeah, so when, when some business owners may look at that and look at this list, you know, I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, the answer is, is obvious, but, but why does this need to be done? Yeah, um, well, it needs to be done, like I said before, just so we have a real fulsome understanding of the business and understanding uh, in detail uh, w what's going to be acquired. So somebody is making a significant investment in your business and, you know, while the, the real value to the buyer is in the future, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of acquiring the future cash flows of the business. 
to really make sure that that projection makes sense, we have to understand what's happened in the past and make that connection between the two. So that's why we look at things in such a detailed level is to make sure it marries up with uh, the forecast and ultimately the value that's been proposed for the company. Got it. So when we um, look at specific businesses and we're looking at, at diligence requests, how, how long does this usually take and then who from the company is, is going to be, be involved? Because we talked you know, uh, with, with the legal side and sometimes business owners prior to a letter of intent, or right, sometimes even after a letter of intent, don't want to disclose uh, the fact that they're selling the, the business. But to do all this work on their own might be pretty difficult. It, it generally, uh, generally is. Yeah. So I think, you know, when you think of it in terms of how long does this process take, it's a bit of a sliding scale. So um, again, from the financial and tax due diligence side, we're usually the first group to really kick off the detailed due diligence after the letter of intent is signed. Um, so what you're going to get is that first initial list from us, and then there will be, you know, a flurry of activity right away. Yeah. And um, so over the first couple days to a week from when we get in engaged and have a kickoff call with, you know, the business owner's company, um, th there will be uh, a large amount of data processed right away. Then continuing on over the next couple weeks, uh, there will continue to be some back and forth, but hopefully that's the type, uh, on at least on the financial and tax, we can front load that work. And then from there, we're just doing analysis and asking questions. Um, to your point about who should be involved, it's you know a bit of a sensitive subject sometimes with business owners who they let know and when in the process. Right. Um, but I would say, you know, your key financial person or people are are going to be very important to you in this process. It's a lot of information that we ask, analyze, and then have a bunch of questions on again to make sure we get a, we get a full analysis of the business. So trying to do that without your you know whether it be CFO, controller, bookkeeper. Uh, Outside accounting firm. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is, without having them understanding what's happening is is generally difficult. And you know, the other thing is, you know, you don't want to insult someone's intelligence. With if all of a sudden you're asking for a bunch of information and digging through things that you may not have ever looked at before, people will start to figure out what's going on. And oftentimes, it's worse for them to speculate on what's happening rather than having that open conversation about why we're asking for these things and how they can be helpful. Right. So are, are you just having conversations with them remotely? Or is there a point, you know, uh, I'm sure business owners would, would wonder, are you actually going out and visiting the facility? Um, but we, we can do it both ways. I think we've generally found that uh, after we've done the bulk of our analysis with all that information we've requested, generally the most efficient thing to do is have a face-to-face -face meeting to go through all of our Q&A follow-up requests. And, and those things, and that generally will take a day or so of time. Mm -hmm. And um, we, again, we generally find that having that be a face-to-face -face conversation, whether that's at the company or you know at at your attorney's office or wherever yeah. that may be, just helps the process go more quickly. Yeah, and, and that's something at, at MCM that we require. You yeah. know, obviously we've we've uh, used Cohen a, a, a number of times and would request that uh, that management or at least a business owner allow. Uh, you the opportunity to to visit. Uh, w one of the other um, sticking points, I, I, I think, from a business owner's perspective, in diligence and create some consternation or worry or concern is generally there's a lot, uh, not a lot, but there's personal expenses that would be run through a a business, and the business owner entrepreneur is worried that you know our financial and tax diligence that, that it's an IRS audit and they're coming out to to get me right you yeah. know right and and I, I can assure you it's not <laughs> <laughs> you know this kind of ties back to the conversation we were having before uh, you know around why we're asking for a lot of the information we are and one of the key things we want to understand is adjustments to EBITDA right so there is the uh, there's the financial results of your business as you report them and then you know what we're really trying to get to is okay, well, what are the results of this business as, you know, it would be under uh, future ownership, yeah. right? So those are things often like, well, you know, if this is not owned by one individual, you're probably not going to have things like country club dues yeah. or, you know, travel that may not be 100% business related right. or other things like that running Car through the business. Or, yeah. yeah, wife's car, cell phones, things like that, which, you know, at the end of the day might add up. 
and you know if you're a business owner with you know a company that has three million dollars of earnings if there's you know a hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars of that type of stuff going through the business and we can identify that well that just makes your company look better because right. that's extra cash flow that would be there to service debt you know invest in capex other things going forward yeah. so it's all part of the the process of just really making sure that we understand what's you know what's really there in the business in terms of a recurring level of cash flows right and at the end of the day it's, it's beneficial to owners because it increases their EBITDA. We're always paying a multiple, That's you right. know, of, uh, of EBITDA. So that $200,000 can mean, you know, one to one and a half, sometimes even $2 million of, of value. That's right. Depending on the business. Uh, so, you know, uh, becoming more commonplace now today uh, has been a sell side quality of, of earnings. I, I, I guess first maybe we, we take a step back and kind of define what quality of earnings actually is for the business owners that, that don't know, and then we can get into the second part of that. Sure, so our work on the financial due diligence really gets boiled down into uh, a report, and the hallmark of that report is what we call the quality of earnings analysis, which uh, highlights some of the things we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So that is an analysis where, where we will kind of bridge the reported results of the business down to what you know, what we understand and believe to be the recurring, you know, operating EBITDA of the business. So that will take out things like the owner's personal expenses that may be in the business. It would also adjust for things uh, that are maybe one time in nature that have happened over the last 12 months. So if there was um, a lawsuit and you had ex extra legal fees mm -hmm. or, you know, a lawsuit kind of went your way and you had kind of a payment come in those things that aren't really part of the recurring you know cash flow or operations of the business um, those types of things or any things that we would think of as non-cash right so if you're if you have booked a reserve to pay out a big bonus and then didn't well there's going to be financial statement implications to that and, and we just try to take out all that noise yeah. and get down to what we call the adjusted EBITDA of the business which really f then factors into your ultimate valuation. Um, and the goal is to just to have that be kind of a, a, a clean number that's free of any of those one-time, unusual, or, or non-cash items. Right. So this, this type of work has historically been very heavily, um, you know, the work of a buyer group, or it's been very heavily a, um, a service purchased by the, by the buyers to make sure that, again, the company they're buying, the financials match up to what they've seen before they had a chance to dive in deep. Um, something that's really developed over the last five or six years is um, a lot more business owners have been electing to have somebody like ourselves go through that same process for them before they go to market for the with the business. So we, saw, we call that a sell side quality of earnings. And that's got a lot of benefits for the seller, in particular if your company is not audited, you know, and you've not really had that hard external look at your numbers before, um, you know, other than you know, just maybe a bank examiner coming every once in a while. Right. So that, that has a lot of benefit because it will, A, prepare your team for the process you're about to go through. We can shake loose any of the items that, as we see them, may typically be a concern for a buyer yeah. if they didn't know about it, and help you prepare to either just hey, have that conversation with buyer groups on why these things happened, what they mean, and how does it impact your value. Yeah, and so solidify, solidify the veracity of, of the numbers. That's right. right. So that, you know, the, the, the one thing you really want to avoid and the thing that can really cause issues during a process is if you've presented potential buyers with some financial results and they've, they've uh, developed a value based on those results, and then ultimately they find something in their due diligence mm -hmm. um, that, that gives them a different picture. Yeah. So doing the sell side quality of earnings will help you avoid that from happening and you know, avoid having the, the stress of being in a situation where, you know, hey, maybe at the beginning of this we've valued your company at $20 million, mm -hmm. but then we found out these things and now we actually think it's closer to 15 to 17. Um, Having that knowledge up front just sets expectations and makes the whole process go more smoothly. And then the, the secondary benefit is when the buyers do come in to do this process, um, they've already got 
75% of the work done. Right. They, they know somebody else has taken a look at it. A lot of the analysis and schedules that we would do on the buyer side is already prepared and it's ready to be handed off to them. So it uh, shortens that time between signing the LOI and closing. And you know, that's, critical, that's a critical time for the seller, right? Because that's when they're at most risk of value leakage. Yeah. You know, that's when there's the biggest risk from that headline number uh, that was put in the LOI to what's ultimately paid. And so keeping that period of time short, concise, and controlled I is really important for yeah. a seller. And, th and that sell side QOE, you know, uh, gives private equity firms or buyers less reason to try and retrade, you know, because you're putting everything up and out front. Yeah. You, you already did all the... I guess your own financial due diligence and, and the quality of earnings and would certainly help certainty of close and you know ag again uh, buyers uh, are less apt to, to retrade or they yep. it, at least they don't have a leg to stand on yep and um, you know and I think from the from the business owner and the seller's perspective you know if you have someone do the sell side QOV you know having that process unearth both positive and negative items it, is a good thing either way yeah. because you're just prepared to have that conversation and you know ahead of time where pain points might be for a potential buyer. Yeah, it's, it's not going to surprise you. You can prepare, yep. you know, or, or at least alleviate, mitigate some of the risk in, in some of your answers. Yep. So uh, not to put you on the spot here, but ge generally, if you can give me a range of, of what a quality of earnings generally costs. The, the real answer is it depends, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like with anything else. Um, yeah, size, complexity of the business, yeah. um, y you know, what the shape of the financial records are in now. But, you know, it, it really, you know, for, for a middle market company can range anywhere from, you know, thirty to $70,000 based yeah. on how much work is needed. Yeah, but, but it, in, in my mind, if I was a seller or a business owner, that's thirty to $70,000 well spent going into a transaction, knowing all the great things, the flaws, and setting expectations for myself and not allowing that potential buyer to come in and try to retrade. Yeah, to the, the, the level of you know, additional certainty that it gives you as a seller, um, I think we've, we found has been really helpful for our, our clients on the sell side. Yeah. So now on, on the quality of earnings, what if I'm a smaller business or e e just on the diligence side, I'm a smaller business and I'm operating QuickBooks or a less sophisticated um, financial reporting software. Is, is that a problem? Uh, generally, no. I, I don't don't think it is. Um, in particular, if, if you're a business using QuickBooks, so that is such a ubiquitous system in the in the lower middle market, in especially. Um, it's that's such a ubiquitous instrument in the lower middle market, especially that firms like us we have our own ability to to use QuickBooks. So if the business owner is comfortable with it, we can just take that whole file, which may have. 60, 70 percent of the stuff we're going to ask you to produce for us, and we can just pull those records ourselves. Yeah. Uh, that saves time for you know you, the business owner, your team, and compiling all that data. And all we need is the file and the password to get into it, and you know can really shorten the amount of time uh, and effort your team needs to spend on it if you know you're, you're willing to give us that access. And th sometimes with a less sophisticated reporting system, you know they might not be able to answer some of the questions that you're asking. So if, you know, they, they don't have a sophisticated system, maybe they don't know gross margin by, by product line. Yeah. Um, they might have to do a physical at the end of every month or something like that. How, how do you deal with that in a quality of earnings if a business owner can't produce, you know, the, the answer to your question? Yep. So the, the, the first thing we would do um, is just at the beginning of our process, we take our standard request list and just walk through it with the company and find out, you know, hey, these are the general things we would ask for. You know, you tell us, do you think you have this or not? Do you have something right. similar or not? You know, because what we're, what we're trying to get to is, a, is an answer or an analysis. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have exactly what we're asking for, well, what, is do you, what else do you have? Yeah. How can we, how can we fair, find a way around this to just to, to get to the analysis we're trying to do? Mm -hmm. um, and generally, we, I think we can find a way. Um, sometimes, sometimes you just can't get there. Um, and, you know, that just ends up being a a finding that we have in our process. And we have to let someone like the, bu the buyer, our client, know that, well, we can, we can tell you these three things, 
but we can't tell you things four and five that we might want to. It's like, okay, we can, we can tell you how much of this product they're selling and whom they're selling it to, um, but just because of lack of sophistication in the system, we can't tell you exactly the margin of each of those and the differences in the margin between them. And ultimately, that's uh, if there is nothing we can do in that regard, uh, but again, like I said, sometimes there are. Sometimes there's alternate ways to get the, to some estimates. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not exactly syst system-driven information, but we can come to some estimates. Um, but at the end of the day, that will just color the, the again, the overall value assessments of the buyer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they can't prove out, so to say, some uh, initial theories that they had on where exactly the margin or the dollars were coming from by, by product or, you know, by customer. Um, you know, it, it just depends on whether that ends up being a, you know, a big deal to the, to the, to the buyer. buyer. Yeah. And, um, but hey, at the end of the day, we can only analyze what information there is. Yeah. So sometimes we have to find some workarounds and then sometimes we just have to just can't ultimately work. caveat it that, hey, there are some things. And, and ultimately, I think everybody knows, especially a, a sophisticated buyer like a private equity firm is going to know that perfect information doesn't always exist. It, it perfect information rarely exists. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes there are things you know and sometimes there's things you don't know. On the tax side of it, uh, w in your experience, what have been some of the, the common things that might crater a deal on, on the tax side? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the common things on the tax side where I think a business owner who's thinking of selling their business can do very easily just to get, them, get themselves ahead of the curve um, is just making sure all of their tax documentation around their, their structure is in order. Um, you know, if you have multiple shareholders, just make sure you got the documentation around you know, who owns what percentage, you know, mm -hmm. who's the rightful owners of all the shares, how you've distributed uh, dividends to those shareholders over time, that can be very important. Um, if you are an S corporation, you know, you should have certain notifications from the IRS that say, you know, yes, we've accepted that you're an S corporation and, and you can uh, operate and follow your taxes as such. And so making sure that simple things like you have those documents just in order and ready for somebody like us to take a look at goes a long way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from there, it's, it gets a little more um, detailed as you go into the state level. Um, mm -hmm. But again, relatively simple things, like if you're selling a product and you think you're exempt from sales tax, <laughs> collect some exemption it's certificates. certificates yeah. it's, uh, we it's see a that a lot. <coughs> it's a simple, simple thing that alleviates a lot of risk. Yeah. Um, again, and if, if you're dealing with, particularly if your customers are larger companies, uh, they get those requests all the time and, you know, it should be pretty simple for them yeah. to get that to you and just takes a whole issue off the table right yeah. away if you just have that documentation. Yeah. Especially order. if it's a stock sale too. Yes. With, with so, and, and maybe, you know, that the drawing that distinction would be helpful for a business owner, but, you know, in terms of the level of tax due diligence we're going to do, if, you know, you are selling the stock of the company, um, we're gonna have to dig a lot deeper because those past tax uh, issues are going to transfer to the buyer if you're buying the stock of the company. Uh, if you're doing an asset sale, there's, there's more of a cutoff on some of those historical uh, potential tax liabilities. So that can create a little bit of a difference in the depth of the tax due diligence just because there's less of a risk for the buyer. Yeah. I, I think this was extremely, ex extremely helpful. If, is there one thing that you could leave a, a business owner with to, you know, aside from doing the sales IQE, to, mm -hmm. to just prepare for this type of, of diligence, both financial and tax? Um, I'll just reiterate something I said before, is that this will be a lot easier on you. Um, if you get a couple key people from your organization involved, um, and everybody's gonna have to make the decision for themselves when that time is, right. um, but that, especially on the financial and tax side, that'll really alleviate a lot of the stress on you, the business owner, because you'll have four or five other streams of diligence going on that may really need your time and attention more than the financial side would. Yeah. So I'd say just r really, again, it, it's a tough situation sometimes, and when you tell folks you're thinking of selling your business, um, but it'll really pay some dividends if you get your financial person involved. Well, great, Justin. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Sure thing, Bob. Yeah, take care. All right.
thank you for taking the time to watch another episode of Well Capitalized. Please subscribe to our channel below. And if you have any additional questions, please leave them in the comments section. Thank you.